welcome to my show, Kunal. Thank you so much for taking our time and meeting me. Um, we are in Goa and you have moved here. Can you tell me about that? First of all, thank you so much for having me on the show, Musku. It's a pleasure. I'm very happy to be a part of this show. Uh, the Goa move, uh, actually I've been planning to do that for quite some time now. Uh, and because I play mainly online, so Goa was just an uh, obvious choice to move and uh, have a better lifestyle compared to Bombay. My wife, Sonia, she, she had just settled in Bombay at that point of time and she had started her work. So she wasn't very keen to move uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, during the lockdown, unfortunately, she was stuck in Goa while I was in Bombay for six months. And while she was in Goa for six months, she realized that there's a lot of work that she could do in Goa. And uh, in between during the lockdown, she said, can we move to Goa? So I was more than happy and that's how it happened and we uh, oh decided God. to be here. I was going to, my follow-up question was, how did your wife react to this? But it, this is <laughs> insane. That, no, you know, because I, actually the decision was uh, entirely on her. I had uh, suggested moving to Goa about a couple of years back to her. Yeah. And at that time, she had just started working in Bombay and she settled down over there, so she, we couldn't make the move. But right now, she was in a, she found some good options in Goa and that's, that's how it happened. So yeah. I guess it was meant to be. So lately, many poker players have been thinking about moving to Goa. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific reason for that? Uh, see, if you're staying in a place like Bombay and Delhi, I think Goa is just a better alternative because it's a better lifestyle. Things are cheaper, it's a chilled out uh, atmosphere. Then you have the three casinos in Goa where a lot of uh, tournament, live tournament series in India happen. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I guess a lot of poker players are here. Uh, they can play the live series when it happens over there and mostly the rest of the time is spent online. So when you're playing online, you could be in Goa, you could be in Bombay, you could be in any part of the world for that matter. So it really won't make uh, too yeah. much of a difference. I feel uh, definitely it adds a lot to your lifestyle because you know your fitness wise you can go for a beautiful walk on the beach you can you're eating so healthy food you yeah. just become more fitness conscious I believe it yeah I mean overall lifestyle goes through a change right you're staying in a city like Bombay I can speak for Bombay because I've been in Bombay for uh, more than 10 years now it's a hectic lifestyle and you I obviously know. don't get that kind of uh, lifestyle that you would want where you, uh, you know, life is in a chilled out uh, yeah, there's space, no you get mind. time for everything. Like I've just moved to the new house and it's, it's I'm, I'm surrounded by nature. I get up in the morning and my first uh, cup of tea is sitting outside the house looking at the greenery and having a I cup know. of tea. You can't do things like that in Bombay. So I it's just imagine. like, uh, it's nice. nice. What to are the pros and cons, Kunal? Uh, the pros is obviously, like I mentioned, having a much better chilled out lifestyle. Uh, some of the cons, which I've, I mean, it's too early for me to say about the cons, but like what I've seen in the last two days is something like uh, as basic as having power cuts. Uh, coming from Bombay, I don't know what a power cut is. <laughs> I never needed to oh, have yes. an inverter at home yes. or a UPS at home. Oh my God, uh, yeah. I just realized in Goa that there are uh, power cuts happening. So just, I, I moved in like four days back and uh, yesterday I got the inverter set up at my place. And now I'm looking for a UPS to ensure that even when the electricity moves to the inverter, you, that brief... Your uh, Wi-Fi should be... Uh, yeah. Wi-Fi is still fine, but the computer restarts. So oh, yeah. you, when you, if you're in the middle of a hand and you're playing like 10 tables, you don't want that to happen. So now I have to put a UPS to take care of that. These are some of the cons as such, but I, I guess I, I'll take that. I mean, the advantages, I think, are far more superior uh, than uh, the cons. These are things you can deal with. So I heard a very funny story about your broker telling you that please don't mention it to the owner that you're a poker player. Tell me about that. So you've done your research. <laughs> uh, this was the last time when I was moving my house in Bombay from uh, Bandra to Juhu. So when the broker broker asked me, what do I do? I said, Ki, I play poker professionally for a living. And uh, poker, as you know, in India is not something which is really uh, understood by most people because it's a card game and people associate poker with gambling. And he wasn't sure how the landlord would uh, react to it and he said Ki, if i can request you can you say that you are a banker or something like that which you were earlier yeah. and uh, i was very clear about it i said no i'm not going to do that because i'm very proud of what i do and i'm very happy about it and i know for a fact that it's a game of skill so that's what i'm going to say uh, he said okay go ahead uh, it's no problem the funny part is when i met the landlord and he asked me what i do i told him that i play poker professionally and he was very very excited because uh, he wanted to understand and he uh, what the game is all about and if people are actually doing it 
professionally in India. So it worked out fine in the end. I didn't have to. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. I thought it was a similar story for you in Goa as well. But, you know, I'm sure, um, you know, that problem like with time, I mean, that was a couple of years back. And now things have changed, right? Do you yeah, think, yeah, yeah. Like you have been a witness of uh, the poker boom in India. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your perception? I think we we have not not even touched the tip of the poker boom, if if I might say, because we've we still have like what a handful of players who are doing it uh, professionally. Uh, I, I think that there, there there would be about one fifty to two hundred of us who actually do this for a living, in the sense that you know we get up every day and then in the evening we start grinding online, whether it's playing a tournament or whether it's playing a normal cash game. They, 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 I don't think there'd be more than one fifty two hundred or maybe at the at the tops, about 300 to 400 were doing it. So imagine uh, from a country with a population of 1 billion, you have only about 400 people who are doing this for a living. Imagine. The rest, everybody who's playing poker today, who we are playing against in the casino or live on any, uh, online on any sites, are all recreational players. So uh, this scope for so many more players to come in and try and take this up uh, for a living, and which you can see today with uh, all the young guys who are doing it. Uh, I mean, we started, probably at a slightly uh, uh, later stage, but there are uh, guys who are now just uh, fresh out of college, 18 year old, 19 year old, who are doing this regularly and they're doing so well, they're crushing it online. You can see some of the young guys who are like killing it online. So uh, it's a game which is uh, just uh, going to grow by leaps and bounds. There's still lots to happen. It's going to be interesting to watch what happens, uh, you know, in India, especially too with poker. Yeah. Like someone like me who, it's a complete like different background. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I obviously I was always attracted to card games, but I never even knew that one could p pursue it professionally. Yeah, that's the first time when you yeah. and I, yeah, you know, were part of a first professional poker team yeah. um, back in 2015. Yeah, and you were a banker for 13 years, yeah. private banker. How did that happen? Uh, I guess it was meant to be. So there's nothing that I planned. Very frankly, for it. Uh, in fact, uh, so I left my job in 2015 and before that I, I probably started playing poker about three, four years back, you know, with uh, friends occasionally, you know, once yeah. once in two weeks or three weeks. I, I picked up the game when I uh, started playing on Zynga Poker Online. That's how I yeah. uh, picked up the game. And then I was itching to play the game with somebody else uh, just to, because I love the game so much. Unfortunately, most of my friends and people I knew were the ones who had not heard of poker and would not play. So even if, you know, once in a while we used to play, we used to end up playing Teen Patti. Uh, <clears throat> post that, I joined this other, this new company, uh, India Infoline. Uh, this was in 2013, I guess. And the CEO of the company, Karan, was a huge uh, poker fan. He used to love the game. And he used to have a game in his house with employees of the uh, company once in two weeks or so. That's wow. where I started playing a little more regularly. And I got uh, more and more uh, intrigued by the game. Have you seen that episode from Billions? Yes, I have. Oh, wow. Yes. Was it I, like I, that? that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, not somewhat like that, but uh, we used to have uh, those games where, we, where all of us were, you know, playing and learning. We didn't, there was nobody who had been playing the game for a long time to try and teach us. We were playing, experimenting, making mistakes, learning, yeah. and so on. And enjoying. And enjoying, of course. Obviously, yeah. it was always a lot of fun. It wasn't really meant as a team building uh, exercise by Karan at that point in time. It was just something that he enjoyed and there were like eight, ten of us in the office who also liked doing it. So once oh, in a while, we used to amazing. do it. And then in 2014, towards the end, f for the first time, I got to know of tournament poker because we used to play only cash games at Karan's house. And I read about tournament poker and I realized that this is something which is even more interesting. It, it, it uh, interested me more than the normal cash game. And I wanted to play a tournament. So the first ever tournament that I played was somewhere around two, mid of 2014. In Goa, there was some small tournament which happened at uh, Delta in Royal at that point of time. I uh, came for the tournament and as luck would have it, I ended up chopping the tournament. And I really thought that this was something very nice. I went back to Bombay and I started searching for more tournaments in India. But in 2014, yeah. because of the tedious issues, there were no other tournaments that were happening in India. Yeah. And uh, then I thought, let me try and figure out if there's something close by to India where something can happen. And wow, I, and that's I, a great story because, you know, usually your friend <laughs> tells you and all like you yourself, you know, you no, were so I, curious. No, so I, I, I was just uh, curious about it and I started searching for it. And I, and I found out in Macau we had the Asian Championship Poker, which was happening in, 2000, in October 2014. 
So I took a cold leave from office at that point of time <laughs> for about two weeks and I decided to go for it. Did you tell your CEO um, that I'm going for a poker tournament? He, he was smart enough, actually. He t <laughs> I, when I told him that I'm taking a two-week uh, cold leave and he just asked me, where are you going? And I, I said, I'm planning to go to Macau and Hong Kong. He said, you're going to Macau because you want to play a poker tournament there. He was smart enough to know that. And I said, oh, I didn't, I, I kind of acted as if I didn't know that this tournament series is happening, but he was very smart. So I ended up going for it in 2014. And... Uh, I ended up winning the first ever international tournament that I played and the second ever tournament that I'm playing. I, I know. That was and amazing, Kunal. It was, yeah. that was because that was a big news in India. It, it, I didn't, very frankly, I didn't realize how big it was at that point of time because when I played the tournament, I, I didn't do it for the money. I, I didn't do it for anything else. I just did it for the experience and the fact that I loved playing the tournament format. So I went there and I won it and suddenly after I won that uh, tournament, I started getting friend requests on Facebook from unknown people who had, <laughs> whom I had never heard about. Yeah. Uh, but I knew that they were somehow related to poker because there was some profile picture of theirs which were related to poker. Poker Guru started sending me requests for an interview. OPN started sending me a request for an interview, gut shot. So some of these Indian uh, online media sites started sending me requests for a... Like you had arrived in the poker scene. I didn't, I didn't know that. Very frankly, I didn't yeah. know. And it's very funny because, frankly, I didn't realize that it was a big deal at that point of time because uh, exactly. I didn't really uh, exactly. think it was that big. Yeah. At that there was point nothing. Of time, there was nothing happening around yeah. poker in India. So we actually, like all of us, when we started our journey exactly in that year, mm. we didn't know what's happening. Exactly. You know, we just did it out of our own, you know, yeah. curiosity and then it just all this happened, you know. And, and you know, the funny thing is that when I won it in October 2014 in Macau, at that point of time, there was only one more Indian who was present in Macau and that was JD Saz. So he had, he <laughs> oh, had one... Yeah. He had won some satellite on Poker Stars and he had come for the same series. And I remember he was the first Indian and the only Indian who was there at that point of time. And obviously I wanted to celebrate, but I didn't know anybody in the whole poker room. But did you and, meet him? Uh, was that the first time you met him? That was the first time I met him. He's the first guy who actually came and congratulated me from India. Wow. And I still remember that. And um, I, I obviously had heard a few names, very frankly. I'd heard your name. Uh, I'd heard Amit Jain. I'd heard obviously Sushant, Aditya Sushant and uh, Adi Agarwal for sure. So I'd heard all these names and I knew that yeah. these are guys who are playing pokers. And some of them were expected in Macau a few days later. So I actually ended up meeting uh, Adi like three, four days uh, post that when he came to uh, Macau post that. And that's how the whole uh, journey started at that point of time. And, and now you guys are such good friends. And uh, now obviously I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, I, I would not have thought at that point of time, you know, that I'd be sitting across Muskan and having an interview and she would be <laughs> interviewing me for something. Because no. those were names that she, very frankly, we looked up to. I, I still remember when we were signed up as Adda 52 Pros back in uh, 2015, uh, January. Uh, team Spades. Team, team Spades. I, I was the only unknown commodity because Muskan yeah. Sethi was a very big name in poker at that point in time. Aditya Sushant, Donka Bomber and Amit Jain, B Black Le Legend were all extremely well-known names in the poker world. And I was the only unknown commodity and the only thing I had on my CV at that point of time was an ACOP win, which, which, which I did not know how big it was, <laughs> but at least, but they, they actually just uh, bet, bet on me as a dark horse at that point of time in uh, 2015 and I'm just happy that they did it and I took up their offer. You don't know this, but uh, we actually already knew about you. So we, mm. I knew about you and the whole team was so excited, especially the women. Because you were just so, like, obviously chivalrous, gentleman, like, so sweet, like, always like that. And we knew that you have, you had something very legit, like a win also, mm -hmm. you know, and backing you. And you yourself didn't know how big it was. Mm. And... And then on top of that, you were such a good personality, someone who can, and someone coming from, uh, you know, as a private banker, making I, that... I guess that was the actual difference because, you know, mostly everybody else who has been playing poker are the guys who have uh, uh, never really been in the corporate life. Uh, if you've been in the corporate life, especially if you've been a banker, you're used to a very, very different kind of a lifestyle, you know, you're disciplined, you have your times when you get up and... You know, you go to office, you have your client meetings on time. You, you, you're you dressed in a particular way because as bankers, you're always suited and booted. So that kind of, you know, extends to even when you're playing poker, you are, you are dressed in, in a slightly different way compared to a normal poker player that you would see who would not really care that much. Uh, and rightfully so, because their job is only to play poker. But coming from the corporate background, maybe, maybe that was a little bit of a difference because I used to, I was still 
had that background, so I would be dressed in a particular manner and I used to be a little more disciplined about yeah. everything. So I guess that was the difference. No, there are that. a lot of qualities that you have and I'm telling you, like whenever we discuss about poker players, your name comes and it strikes out where discipline is concerned, being on time, having, you know, all good habits, like all of these things. It's such a good combination. Like I, I'm, uh, they, they, they also make fun of me because of that. No, I don't know no. how, much, how much you've heard about it, but, uh, but I, at least I, I know for sure that like Romit and Dhawal and all, they, they've named me, and I, I, I'm actually saying it on the interview, but they've named me Subodh. I don't know if you... If you <laughs> I uh, remember. The, the Dil Chata Dil movie, Chata. That, that character of Subodh who used to do everything on time. <laughs> yeah. And for them, you know, me just be getting up on time and reaching on time for a poker tournament is like, uh, they so, you know, they pull my leg and they say, you're, you're the Subodh of the poker. No, <laughs> no. I, you add so much to the poker mm -hmm. community. Because of that, you're a leading example, and it's something I urge all the youngsters to follow, you know, that kind of lifestyle, because that's when you'll go a long way. Uh, like I said, it's just been an extension of my corporate lifestyle so when you are used to a particular lifestyle when you know you have timings when you're going to office when you have timings and you have to meet clients and prepare for your uh, client meetings similarly when you're approaching a poker tournament you're doing the same thing it's it's like a client meeting so you know that your poker tournament is starting at 10 o'clock so i would How, what's your pre-game routine if it's at 10 a.m if the it's the night at, before the night before, obviously try and get a good night's sleep, okay. uh, sleep well on time, get up. Uh, Do you have a number that I have to sleep this number of hours minimum? I try and at least get a good six to eight hours of sleep before any uh, uh, good tournament, uh, big tournament, yeah. and which, which is, uh, I think, decent enough for anybody. And uh, once I wake up in the morning, just like I don't want it to be very, very rushed. I don't like it if I have to rush and get to the poker tournament because you're already excited about it and you don't want to be in a situation where you're putting yourself under undue pressure. So I just like reaching the venue a good 15-20 minutes before the thing, have my coffee, settle down at my thing. There was a time when before the tournament started, I remember in Macau, every time, the, uh, I don't know if you, you should be remembering Fred, uh, who was the poker stars yeah. marketing guy. Every time before a tournament started, he used to, when he used to roam, roam around, he used to see, I used to be sitting and playing Candy Crush just before the tournament. Oh. So he used to tell me, what is it that you do ev before every tournament? I said, I just like to come here, get my coffee, sit here. And for 10 minutes before everything starts, I just want to unwind. So I just play a little bit of Candy Crush. So that used to be my uh, pre-game ritual at that point of time. Uh, now it could be slightly different, just go and sit in, sit in my chair and uh, listen to some music. Uh, or uh, there are times when I listen to the Om chant, which uh, a good friend of mine, Meherzad, told me about. I do so that I, too. I do that, I listen to that. So it could vary a little bit here and there. But yeah, that's... depends on what you really need that day. You know? Yeah. I just, my main thing is to try and reach there and be on time, is what I try and do. It kind of starts getting to me if it's a 10 o'clock tournament and I. Uh, reach there late also for the reason that I personally feel that you know the early stages of a tournament are very important, are very important for two reasons one because you can if if it's a game where the table doesn't change very frequently yeah. then in the early stages you get to know a lot more about your opponents and their playing style and secondly in the early stages of the tournament there are a lot of fishes who are there on the table who are actually could stack off on certain hands which uh, which a seasoned pro might not. So you might be able to accumulate a lot of chips uh, in the early stages of the tournament. That's why I try and play most big tournaments right from the beginning because it's a time to uh, accumulate and get to know your table uh, better. So Kunal, you've been around the world and you've been to Berlin, WBT Amsterdam, Vegas, Macau. Where else have you been? Am I missing out on any place? I, I've actually traveled to quite a few places in the last four or five years. I yeah. think I, I'm one of the most uh, traveled poker players in India right now because I I was obviously um, associated with Adda, so as per the contract, I was allowed to travel a couple of years. Yeah, so I, I guess you've covered quite a few of it. I've, be, I've been to Nottingham, WPD Nottingham. I've, WPD we, were we were there together. How was Berlin? Uh, Berlin obviously was has been my biggest ever um, life score. This was in 2000. 18 January is when I oh. went for WPT Berlin and I ended up coming second in uh, the yes, main event over yes. there. That that was uh, that has been my biggest life score. So that was quite, uh, that's something which I really remember fondly because uh, yes. Germany is one of the toughest places to play poker. You're, exactly. you're well aware they yeah. are amongst the best players in the world. So uh, that's a, that holds a special place in my heart. And that was also during a time where I had reached a stage where I was in two minds whether to continue 
with poker as a career or not because I wasn't sure if I can make a living out of it and that kind of uh, uh, came, at, came at the right time. Uh, so it, it always remains, uh, you know, a special place in my heart. How's the place otherwise? Did you go out? Uh, so what I try and do when I go for any series is I try and reach there a couple of days early or I try and stay back a couple of days uh, post the event to uh, try and see the place. Uh, now I try, uh, from my experience, what I've learned, it's always better to go there early because if you if you break the whole series, then you're not in a bad mood uh, post that. So I try and reach there early. So similarly, for Berlin, I reached two, three days early. And my sister-in-law, who was in London, had come down to meet me there and we were uh, there together and we roamed around a little bit of Berlin and saw. It's a lovely place. I love the place. And we went... Uh, when it was quite cold, uh, and it's nice. I, I love the cold, so Jan January, and I, I, I loved it. I think it's a lovely place. What are your tips for those who are, you know, planning for an international trip, especially to Vegas? Because we have so much fun there. We go to Indian restaurants. You drive yeah. us around. So for Vegas, I actually ended up writing a blog also a couple of years back yeah. explaining what are the things that, you know, people should do when they're planning a trip to Vegas. Or anywhere, you know. Yeah, or anywhere. See, doing it see poker. what is important every when, when you're traveling... A, anywhere is your most expensive thing is obviously your uh, stay option so you try and firstly you try and figure out uh, where you're staying is how far is that place from the actual uh, place where the tournament will uh, be happening because you would need to travel to those places and yeah. you know it's not uh, it's not cheap to travel in other countries in Europe and uh, America compared to India because it's expensive even even for a short distance of one to two kilometers so I try and find a place which is close to uh, the place where the tournament happens, usually within walking distance. Over the last three, four years, I have moved mainly from hotels to Airbnb options because it gives you the flexibility to have your own little house. And if you're sharing it with two, three people, then you know you don't feel uh, uh, alone when you come back after a tournament. You know, you have somebody to chill out with, somebody to talk with and hang out with. So I try and um, go for Airbnb options. I think that's a good thing. And uh, taking a car, if you have to travel a little bit, it, it is always helpful. If you like mm -hmm. driving, the Indian license is accepted everywhere in the world. You do not need to get any international license. The in Indian license is valid. Car and rentals, basically, if you can drive in India, you can drive anywhere. Of course. <laughs> if, you can, if you can drive in India, you can drive in any, any part of the world. All it takes is people keep asking me, are you comfortable driving on the other side of the road? Yeah, All it takes is five minutes of you driving on the other side of the road and you uh, get used to it. So I prefer taking a car if I have to travel on a regular basis. Like when I go to Vegas for a month, month and a half, I pick up the car at the airport the moment I uh, reach Vegas and then I have the car with me throughout for a month and a half and then when I'm uh, flying back, I drop the car at the airport. It just works wonderfully because you do not need to spend on Uber every day uh, in Vegas also. So you, you've been to Vegas so many times. You know, we might have one tournament in Rio, the other one could be yeah, in Venetia, the third one could be somewhere else. But parking else. is an issue. Is it's it? not. Actually, okay. I haven't found uh, it to be an issue a anywhere. Rio has ample parking space. Venetia has... An, all, all of them have ample parking space. Some of them charge you for parking, but when you try and convert into how much you would be spending on Uber to go from your place to that place, it, it actually turns out to be cheaper. And obviously, the convenience of having your own car Go to the supermarket any po at any point of time, pick up stuff and get back to your ha house where, where you need stuff. If you want to go for a drive, which is like good three, four hours away from Vegas to unwind for a couple of days, you can do that. So a car definitely gives you the flexibility yeah. if you're okay with driving and having uh, that as an option. Yeah. You know, everyone, uh, you're like the most picked player when, they, when they're when they deciding to, you know, room with someone abroad. They're like, <laughs> no, I want to stay with Kunal. I want to stay because they're like, he's such a good influence. He'll wake up on time because of him. You'll end up going on time. And, you know, everyone's like, I want to stick with Kunal. So I've heard that um, you maintain an Excel sheet, not just for, I mean, you remember you, you told me also to maintain uh -huh. one. And it was just, um, it changed my life. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I, I used to have just like a lump sum or like a like somewhere written or whatever. I never had a proper Excel sheet for every little mm. buy and every little expense like you taught us. So how do you, what, what is that obviously because you're a banker that comes to you naturally. But uh, like, how do you apply to poker? It does come to you naturally when you, like I said, when you're a banker. But also you have to realize when you're playing uh, poker, you you have to treat it like your own business if you're playing it professionally. And just the way you have your own business, you need to understand how much are, how much is your revenue and how much is your expenses. If you do not keep a track of that, you will never know how profitable that business is for you. 
So what I had started right from the time when I actually st started playing poker professionally is to keep a track of all my buy-ins, as small a tournament as it is online or live, or and if it is for live, what are the other expenses that I'm spending on flights, on hotels, and et cetera, et cetera. So that at the end of the year, I can clearly see whether this year has been profitable for me or not. And that's how the, you know, the Excel sheet thing uh, came in mind. And I've been doing it for the last five years now. I've actually maintained uh, an Excel sheet of all my buy-ins uh, across tournaments, across... Uh, I didn't do it for uh, online that much about three, four years back because I didn't play that much. But yeah, today when you, if you see my last three years Excel sheet, I will have complete uh, buy-in details of every tournament that I played on in every site and my winnings and the TDS and everything. It just uh, does that. Yeah. Coming back to the question, uh, which is very funny about uh, me being a, a roommate which people want to have. Uh, it's just that I'm a little more uh, organized uh, compared to a lot of the other <laughs> poker players, like if, I might, if I might use that, because a lot of them just like love to take things as it goes and I like to plan out a few things. So Yeah, you know, to be honest, I have no problem with that also because hmm. a lot of top level CEOs or people who really made it in life who are actually very busy with a lot of work, they also have a very messy life. Hmm. It's not like very, like it's a, it's a balance of uh, yeah. the two in this world, you know. Yeah. And somehow even those guys are able to make it and then hmm. even guys like you who are, who are able to make it. So I just feel this is much better. And I just feel that if you're organized, you'll just go a longer way and that's the way to live your life. It just sorts out your life a little bit more. Yeah, because you're spending yeah. less energy in making these small, small decisions. And, and you're spending a lot and you're saving a lot of money. So very frankly, for example, if I know that I'm going to Vegas every year and I know my dates, the, the plan for Vegas, the actual schedule for Vegas comes out good three, four months before. And I know that I'm going to be in Vegas from this day to this day. Or for uh, example, let's say <clears throat> somebody knows that I will be playing tournaments in Goa throughout the year. Yeah. So even that is something you know in advance. Yeah. And, so, know? so for example, like why I was talking about Vegas is, so if I know I have to reach Vegas, start playing in Vegas from 1st of June, and I know I'm reaching two days early, I might as well book my flights two months before. I know of people who would wait till the last minute and then book their flights. And you know, the difference in the flight cost obviously adds up to it. In the end, you have to look at all these costs because, I mean, you know you're going to re be there from this time to this time. So I might as well plan early and save on those costs. If I have to rent a villa, yeah. I might as well do it early. So that's, that's what a little organization just brings to it, nothing else. Okay, thank you. So Kunal, now that you know you've been, there's not much live happening and you've been playing online mm -hmm. and you have been crushing this year. Mm -hmm. Last night I was trying to get some juice out, you know, some gossip about you. And in fact, everyone's like, can you please ask him what's the secret behind such a crazy year? So, I mean, what, what, what happened? And also, I mean, you know, definitely there was a, there was a switch that you did because you now recently joined IPP and, you know, you've been working with uh, mm. Danish and uh, Abhishek and all these new guys are around you. Do you think, mm. like, what was the main switch in your life that you feel? I've actually, frankly, been with IPP for over a year and a half, which a lot of people don't know. So it's not that I've been with IPP recently. I joined them about a year and a half back. Yeah. It's been slightly more than that. So IPP has obviously been one of the biggest uh, positive changes that I uh, brought about to my game because I obviously realized that, you know, if I have to do well in this sport where there are young guys who are com coming and, you know, working much harder and learning so much more and, uh, you know, playing with updated strategy, I will have to upgrade myself too. I cannot uh, be left behind. So that was the reason why I joined uh, IPP and I, I, they have been very, very helpful. The last six months, very frankly, I'll tell you one of the biggest changes that I have been able to get to my uh, uh, poker lifestyle is just my mindset. So, uh, I'm if you, so if you, happy to hear that. If you go about six to eight months back and not only six to eight months before that, uh, just like every other poker player, and I'm, um, maybe maybe one guy does it a little more, one guy does it a little less, but all of us have a tendency to talk about bad beats, talk about uh, hands that we've lost in important stages of a tournament, which, which keeps playing at the back of our mind for uh, a long time and which spills over to the next tournament that we are playing. And uh, I, I have to give credit for this to Vaibhav Sharma, who's a very good friend of mine, and he... Uh, made me, uh, he forwarded an article to me, I think it was by Patrick Leonard, and which just spoke about 
having a positive mindset during the game and so on. And which, which said a very simple thing. Your job is to play and take the right decisions in the game. That's all that I can, that you can do. Post that, if, if you have lost a hand where you were 80%, 80-20 favorite or, or anything, you cannot do anything about it. So there's no point thinking about it and getting into a negative uh, mindset. Also thinking about the fact that if I feel that I my poker skill is at level X and I see people who I feel whose level is less than X doing better than me and getting negative thoughts about it is not going to help you at all. It's just... Yeah. Uh, I mean, makes Kar- things yeah, different, exactly, different for you. So in the last six months, my only change that I have tried to bring is have a positive mindset when I s- sit down for a session. I And frankly, today the bad beats don't affect me that much. Today, uh, I do not speak about my bad beats as much as I used to do earlier and share it with people and say, oh my God, I got this bad beat in this stage and all. Everyone gets it. I used to probably talk a little bit more than what a normal uh, poker player was doing. Today, I'm probably uh, speaking about it less than what the other people are doing. I I guess that's been one of the main changes. And touch wood, uh, obviously the cards are, uh, have been falling at the right place. I'm winning the important flips at the right time. So that that has been uh, helpful in the last six months. Okay, so you yourself have said that poker is easy to learn and Mm. difficult to master. When did you realize that, you know, you need to take that step ahead? And I mean, like you said, did you said you wanted to keep up. But what skill set do you think has added into your game uh, by being uh, a part of a stable, especially like uh, Indian poker players? I, I would just like to go back a little bit before I answer that question. So, you know, things came very easy for me in the beginning. You know, like I said, the first ever live tournament that I played in Goa, I ended up chopping it. The first ever online tournament that I played... Uh, live tournament that I played abroad in Macau, I ended up winning it. And in that whole series in Macau, I had like a fantastic run. I made like two, three other final tables. I won the satellite to the high roller. It's like everything was happening quite fast. And then 2014, 2015 itself was again a good year for me because I, while I was playing in the Asian circuit, I made a lot of final tables, etc., etc. And I, at that point of time, I thought I knew everything about poker. Okay. And uh, very soon I realized that I, As I started interacting with more poker players who obviously know the game much more and hearing them discuss hands and how they're playing and strategies, I realized that I actually know only about 5% of what poker is all about. And that's when I realized that I have to, I have had it easy. I've been lucky in the first year that things have happened for me, but I need to learn the game because now I have taken the decision of quitting my job and doing this uh, for a living, I need to upgrade my learning and actually become a good poker player. I don't think I was a good poker player in 2015. I was a lucky poker player at that point of time. So that's when I started working on my game, mainly, you know, through online videos by subscribing. You read a lot of books, right? I read a lot of books. Which were the ones? The first book that I read before I went for my Macau tournament was Jonathan Little's uh, 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 book on tournaments, How to Master uh, MTTs. It's a three-part series. That, That is what gave me the basic understanding of how to play MTTs and that I will always remember. And then I read a, a couple of books, even the Elkies book, Raise Your Edge and a couple yeah. of other books. Those are the ones which give me the basic background of how MTTs are to be played. But you also know as you start playing, things keep changing on a daily basis. And uh, at that point of time, I used to try and, you know, get as much information from everybody around, you know, Amit. I've been fortunate enough to be around Amit Jain uh, a lot with Dhawal, Romit, Akash Malik, Shravan, all of them. These are the guys I've traveled extensively with in 2015, 2016, and all of them are super helpful. You, when you ask them something, they would always help you and tell you. Exactly. You didn't have to reinvent the wheel because you they have they had yeah. been there, done that, they always helped. But somewhere in 2017, 18, I realized that I still need to from that 5% which I knew about the game, I had probably reached about 15 to 20%, but I still need to do much more. And uh, that's when I approached Danish, who I personally feel is by far the best MTT player in India. Uh, if not best, probably the second after Adi. But these two are definitely like a notch above everybody else in India. And I really wanted to uh, learn with Danish. And I approached him and I said, can I be a part of your stable? Uh, and uh, he was, uh, you know, kind enough to allow me to be a part of uh, his table. And that's where, you know, 
my mo most of my learning over the of poker has actually come in the last one and a half years and i've realized even when like you know there are times when danish has done my hand history and uh, i've realized I've, i've been actually making a lot of blunders and i didn't know how to play certain situations so that has helped me in the last year and a half so from that 5% I, if i'd moved to that 15 20% today i feel that you know from that 15% i've pro- at least reached about 35% or 40% of what i think you can know about poker so there's still a long long way to go but yeah compared to what it was in 2015 it's i've i've definitely come a long way in terms of learning uh, yeah again. you have and it's commendable how's your online routine nowadays compared to when you started <clears throat> So when I started initially I used I was more of a live game uh, player. I had traveled extensively in the Asian circuit and around the world to try and play as much poker as I could. Uh which isn't really the best thing to do because when you live tournaments the variance is much more because you're playing fewer tournaments and it's more expensive because of everything else. So online pay- poker is probably a better thing to do which I started doing about 2 years back. Now in the last 2 years uh my online poker schedule also has gone through a f- little bit of changes here and there depending on what state that i'm in there have been times when i played mainly mtts and no cash there are times when i played some cash online some mtt and a mix of everything but i think i have finally settled down and found my comfort zone which is mainly grinding mtts online over the last year or so now the last 6 months has been a little bit of an aberration because of the lockdown and because of so many big tournaments and series happening across sites in india and abroad that you've been really busy so last 6 yeah. months for example uh the first 6 months of the lockdown from march to march april may june july till august 6 months i actually took probably 6 days off so wow. in 180 days i actually grinded tournament series every day for 170 plus days and when were you studying s- with ipp so you're studying and you're playing but oh. during the lockdown obviously uh, also you we didn't have those many yeah, uh, yeah. sessions that happened so you got the time to play a lot more but i didn't really take a break because there was so much happening but on a normalized schedule my schedule i try and play Uh, Sunday obviously everybody is playing on Sunday so I definitely play on Sunday I try and play on Wednesday Thursday and Friday so these four days yeah. of the week I try not to miss uh, there were times uh, a few months back when I used to play Monday Tuesday also and only take Saturday off but now I feel you know you also need some time off so I try and play these four days a week and I would take Monday Tuesday and Saturday off unless there's a big series going on where I need to play even on these days but I try and stick to like these four days and your typical a uh, routine would be start by about 7:38 and then play till uh, whatever 3 in the morning or 8 in the morning depending on where you're playing and how deep you're running get some sleep get up again in the afternoon yeah. and try and take a 2 hour nap before you start the session again that's uh, kind of the normal so what do you do for fun kunal uh I love watching uh, movies and TV shows so I do a lot of it and especially during the lockdown off I I've, I've caught up on probably all the shows on uh, most of the streaming uh, yeah. channels I've I've been doing that I love to travel uh, that's yeah. one of the reason why I I in the la- first 4 5 years when I started playing poker I used to travel so much to different places to play the tournaments these are uh, that's something which I do yeah. and um, then I just I I I like to let my hair down and party once in a while you've seen me partying so yeah. I can I I can I can be quite a party animal at times uh, I try yes. to do that once in a while so that's that's another thing which i enjoy i i enjoy dancing so i've heard you're a great dancer it can we have some music <laughs> <laughs> uh you i i mean those are the times when you when you know you're just letting your hair down and just enjoying it i i'm a big bollywood fan which most poker yeah. players aren't so what they, are your favorite uh, movies uh, any of amitabh bachchan movies i'm a big amitabh bachchan fan uh, i would love uh, any of his movies i'm a big fan of uh, rithik and amir when it comes to indian uh, movie stars and when it comes to uh, hollywood stars i'm a big uh, fan of will smith so i would love his Amazing. movies so i was going through your tiktok videos and now i know the root cause cuz you know you're a bollywood fan so you did it and i honestly really enjoyed them mm-hmm. which ones did you enjoy the most <laughs> see the tiktok thing is actually i, I don't know how it, it kind of became a little viral amongst the poker players or my friends who i know otherwise non poker uh, players also how the tiktok thing started was i was stuck in the lockdown at home where so like i said my wife sonia was in goa so i was all alone at home 
grinding and doing nothing much available and that's when I just picked up the TikTok thing and I saw that you know uh, there are some videos which are really amazing and you know <laughs> me, me being a Bollywood fan I said why not try it so I tried my husband jo hai, oh, First two three times, and uh, you know, my, my family and my friends, uh, they really liked it, and they said, "Ki we," and they genuinely liked it, and they said, "We," I think they were really good. We look forward to the next one. I am uh, Dr. Mishur Gulati TKLV. TKLD क्या मतलब होता है? TKLD क्या मतलब क्या होता है? <laughs> That's when I started doing a uh, few more. Yeah. I've, 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 frankly, I've got mixed reviews. There have been uh, people like uh, Madhav Gupta who <laughs> apparently hates my TikTok videos. No, and no, he, I love your TikTok videos. And he videos. tells me never to do it again. And there are people who actually have been messaging me and saying, you know, yeah. we're looking forward to the next one. So anyway, so it was just a time pass at that point of time. And I did a few of these TikTok videos. Um, no, you did a great job and I know like every video was like even when you do that Dr. Mashoor Gulati or when mm. you do Amir Khan, when you play like uh, Red Beast thing from yeah. Gully Boy. I mean, it's hilarious to watch and it's in, it's very entertaining and a lot of times uh, recently Gutshot magazine use it as memes for, you mm. know, their office. <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying. At that point of time, I didn't realize that something like this was happening. In fact, Gutshot, I think Poker Guru did an article about yeah, four months everyone. back on on uh, TikTok videos where they had Shilpa Shetty, Raj Kundra's TikToks, mine, and even, uh, you know, some of the other guys who are doing TikTok videos in the poker world, uh, like Sanjay Taneja and uh, um, uh, Yuvraj, uh, Dr. Yuvraj. So, yeah. uh, they just did an article. I didn't expect it people to actually do that. There was a time when I was playing on the tables and people just used to ask me about my TikTok videos. And, you know, that's what, that was all they were talking about. They said, we yeah. saw your video today and we liked it or we... When is your next TikTok? So I didn't expect it at that point of time for, for it to become whatever little bit of popularity it got. But it yeah. was just out of fun and time pass. Obviously, once uh, you know things got back to normal and as things would have it, TikTok got banned. So no. no what was your reaction that time? It didn't really make that much of a yeah. difference. Very frankly, I was like I said, I was just doing it for time pass. Yeah. I was enjoying it. I enjoyed uh, being a b big Bollywood fan. It was yeah. just a lot of fun to do it. Uh, you know, use some props and try and do, do something different. With the black board, with the white board and marker and all. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> so some of some of those ideas, very frankly, were not original. They were already videos which were oh, made. Okay. So you would take some of the ideas and then do it because a lot of people haven't seen it. So for them, it would be new. Some of the ideas were new. No, but the uh, effort is but yours, no? Effort was there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, like each video, uh, uh, people would not realize but what they saw was the final output but it some of some of the videos actually i had i have done quite a few retakes to reach a stage where i see the video and i'm like okay i like this video and finally i would want to upload that yeah. so it has I've taken heard it's that. so hard but no i it was very it was very refreshing yeah. because everyone was in the lockdown and you know in general like the only even we have so much banter like as to so many people who trouble you and yeah. you enjoy giving them answers you know yeah. that's the best part i love it see like, very frankly i made the tiktok videos for myself not for and my TikTok, generally, generally like say oh, adi oh, kumar yeah, yeah, when yeah, he yeah, troubles yeah, yeah. you yeah um you know, in the in the uh, like, you're like whenever there's a group and you're in it, like it's like it's it's gonna be Kunal and somebody <laughs> having the banter. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm always up for a good banter. I'm yeah. always up for a good banter. It's good fun. If I you love enjoy it. it, so it's yeah. it's just uh, so you hmm. keep things very upbeat and uh, entertaining always. I want to know where do you see yourself five years from now. I would see myself still playing poker because this is something which I love. Uh, the good thing is even after doing this professionally for about five years, I still get up in the morning and look forward to my day of uh, next day of grinding, which is a great sign, which is something which I wasn't doing when I was uh, in the corporate world, frankly. I'd really? stopped doing that. But today, when I still get up, I look forward to the next day of grinding. So I still see myself playing poker over the next five years, after five years. Hopefully playing uh, bigger games. Hopefully playing uh, bigger tournaments, uh, hopefully getting a bracelet or two because that's the ultimate aim for all poker players. Uh, Is it your aim as well? I, I, I would be lying if I say no. I, I think every poker player wants to play the World Series of poker and try and get a bracelet because it's the ultimate uh, uh, thing for a poker player. So What I would, would you do once it. you reach your goal? 
Once you win a race award, what will you, how will you celebrate? Go, go for the second one. <laughs> That's nice. how it is. But yeah, I haven't really thought of it. Uh, how the celebration also, in, yeah. ha, ha, if obviously it'll uh, mostly if it happens, it'll happen live in Vegas. And if it's in Vegas, uh, you know me. It'll if be a I, bad party. It'll be a big bad party. <laughs> it'll be a big bad party for sure. And uh, you know, most poker players they love partying, and I I would definitely want to throw a big party for for them for sure. That's very it goes nice. without a doubt. I hope. Unfortunately I hope. for me, both my big wins, which have come, have come at a time when there was no one around. So the ECOP win, which I, which happened in 2014, was when I was alone and JD Saz was the only one there. So there was nobody to celebrate with. And 2017 in Berlin, there was only Minisha who was also there. So we didn't really have a big party to celebrate as such. So I'm actually waiting to win big, and it might not even be a World Series, even. Winning a, a big tournament in uh, Goa, uh, one of the DPT or the Bazi Poker Tour or the IPC, you know, the HR or the main event, if I win one of those, having a big party after that is something that I'm yeah. looking forward to. Agreed. I mean, I wish you all the best and I really want to see you win a bracelet quickly because then, you know, generally you deserve it. You've been putting so much mm. hard work and, you know, I, I hope like, you know, how you've been crushing last six months, you're going to be crushing that also when you get to Vegas. Let, let the run good continue. So one of your really good poker buddies is Manisha Lamba, who is mm -hmm. a Bollywood actor also. And, you know, you both have traveled do so many poker destinations together and you know so many fun stories tell us something about you know her and you know your both of your experience of traveling as team pros together uh manisha is actually you know a uh, very very down to earth uh, sweet little girl if i might uh, say she's like the girl next door which is something which you would not expect from somebody who's a very popular uh, bollywood actress she, she has she was very popular at the peak of her career before she stopped doing uh, movies. And, uh, you know, before you meet a person like that, you're always thinking, you know, how how do you behave in front of a person okay. like that? But Minisha is someone who's just, like, puts you at ease. And she's she's the same with everybody who's around. So even at the table, she would probably know me, she would know you, she would know yeah. the usual suspects, you know, dirty sitting on the table and all. We are still friends with her. But even with people who are not friends with her, who don't know her, She's exactly the same. She's just like a, she's just like a normal person who's sitting on the table. She has no airs about herself. So it's just wonderful to have a person like that uh, around you. And you know very well that she can be quite a... At, at times I tell her that also. She's quite a cartoon on the table. She does she very would, cute things. She, she would do certain things which she does, <laughs> even she doesn't realize, but it's too funny. And, she's and they're just so like, natural. And then, exactly. you know, it's like somebody like her just trying to figure out yeah. how to make a t poker tournament easy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, I love it. Like, you know, she has, a, a, you know, her own uh, personality that yeah. she brings on the table and just fills it up with colors. And, yeah, one thing I can't forget ever. <laughs> Initially, I remember that, you know, there was a time when they didn't, she was on the final table of one of the DPT events, I think, and they obviously, because of the live, rec of the recording, they don't allow phones on the table. And she actually went and said, Ki, you know, I need a calculator. And <laughs> we said, Ki, why do you need a calculator? She said, I need to calculate the number of blinds that I have. <laughs> so she would sit there and when the blinds increase, what her stack is, and then she'll try and figure out how many blinds she has. They're just like uh, super funny. for. Uh, and then you don't even know if she's following some superstition that day. And yeah. if you try to do something like she has, she's like, okay, if you do this, you will win. If you do <laughs> that. Okay, Kunal, tell us some more funny stories from Goa, from like... Uh, you've also met so many um, uh, big poker players, mm -hmm. like celebrities, and did you have any fanboy moments? I had uh, a fanboy moment with uh, Daniel Negreanu a couple of times, wow. actually. Uh, I'm not, not really a big fan of Negreanu in terms of his poker playing uh, skills, because I, I, I definitely feel they're way better poker players than Negreanu. But just for the ambassador that he has been for the game for years together, I've been a big fan of uh, Daniel Negreanu. So in uh, Vegas, there was a time when he was sitting on the table right next to me. And uh, I actually ended up going up to him and asked him for a selfie. Aww. And there was, uh, the last day, he was also on the same table, very briefly, for about 15, 20 minutes. But we were on the same table together in one of the Omaha tournaments. And he was there. That's, that's another time when I took another selfie with him. So he's been the only one who's been like a fanboy moment for me. In, and who are the these better poker players that you uh, mentioned, like the most feared poker players that you know you felt that you were not able to uh, play uh, that easy? See, the good thing is when I travel abroad, I'm quite a noob. So I don't know too many of the 
international poker players very well. I would know the I would know the top 10, 15 players and I would know how they look and who they are, etc. But beyond that, I don't really know the poker players too well uh, internationally, which has actually worked to my advantage quite uh, a lot of times because when I'm sitting on the table, I don't know that this guy is a real sick player or a real uh, top player. And I'll tell you an extremely funny story. I'll come to that. Remind me about that because it's a, it was a very funny story that happened in WPT Berlin. Yeah. So that has worked to my advantage. I don't know who they are. So that is the thing. When it comes to India, uh, there are there was a time when I never wanted Amit Jain, B Black Legend or Raghav on my table. <laughs> and I used to have something because I, I actually looked up to both of them so much that I used to get a mental block when they used to be on my table. And I remember actually Raghav coming and telling me, bro, I like the fact that you look up to me and you think I'm a good poker player, but don't keep saying that to me because it's not only working to, it doesn't make me feel that great, plus it is uh, not good for your game because you're having a mental block and he was right. Raghav so, is just so amazing, you know, oh yeah, he's yeah, yeah. so honest. So he himself came and told me about that. So these are the two players at that point in time who I would not want. Uh, thankfully, in a way, Amit Jain doesn't play too many tournaments nowadays, so I don't meet him that much on the table. But f currently, if I don't want somebody on my table, it will be Shri Harsha. I definitely don't want him on my table because I just kind of, I think he's one of the most difficult poker players to play against. And obviously, Danish. I mean, yeah. for other reasons also, given the fact that he's he's my coach also, and I know that uh, you are also, you know, second guessing yourself before you're playing a particular hand on how he would react later and all that happens. So I, these are the two people I would not want on my table. Now I want to come yeah. back to the, uh, the funny story. stories and parties. Tell us like so. No, no, this is not really a party. So like I said, I don't know too much about international poker players and how well they have done or who they are and by their face. So in WPT Berlin, when the event in which I came second, uh, in that particular event, uh, it was a WPT series, obviously. So WPT live uh, on their website was covering it and they used to have yeah. hand histories and so on. So there was a particular poker player who was written as the German superstar. I'll give you the name slightly later. German superstar so-and-so wins this hand. And then there were certain hands which were covering me also and something. So now this guy who was covered on day two of the event was sitting on my table right to my left or to my right, I don't remember, but he was sitting right next to me. And he he was also a little talkative friendly, he was talking to me. And so why, during the talks, then I, I, the night before I had seen my table draw and I had read the German superstar so-so. So, -so. so yeah. on the table, I actually ended up asking, asking him that, you know, I've been reading, following the updates of WPT and they keep writing German superstar, Who is your superstar? name. So I said, Ki, are you like a singer or a rock star or something because they keep talking about you like this or do you play poker for a living and so on, etc, etc. And uh, that guy was also very nice and he said, no, I try and play poker a little bit and all that. And later on, the same night I came back home and I googled his name and the name of the player that I'm talking about is Ole Skimion. Now, Ole oh, Skimion, Ole Skimion for a lot of people who would not know is number two in terms of uh, live earnings after Fedor from Germany. He's the second. I remember. Yeah. I mean, those of you who can't recall, I mean, we will put a picture here of yeah. Ole Shemion, but he's like really, you know. Uh, oh, he, uh, then I looked up his uh, shark scope and I saw that he's won probably all the high rollers in uh, Vegas. You know, the 10K at Aria, 5K at Aria. He's won so many of them. And I felt so stupid that evening when I came back to the hotel yeah. and I looked him up. But at that point in time, I didn't know who he was. And probably it helped me because if I knew that this is Ole, who's such a big player who's sitting there, I would have played, it would have affected my natural game. But when I don't know who that person is, it has uh, been uh, different. So when I came back and I told the stories to some of the few friends, you know, Rajat Sharma, my, he's a very good friend of mine. He still pulls my leg about Ole and he yeah. says, Ki, oh, why don't you, do you remember the time when you did that with Ole? But that, that was a funny story. So I just thought I would yeah. share that. It's, it was just too funny. I thought he was a rock star and it, I didn't know he was a <laughs> poker player. Um, is there anything embarrassing that happened on a poker table around you? Uh, or oh, one? yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I can't forget this. This is this happened in my first ever World Series, which I went for in 2015. So I uh, registered for this tournament and uh, thinking it's a bounty tournament, World Series of Poker event bounty tournament. And I go and sit at the table. And uh, as the cards are being dealt, I suddenly look at the dealer and I say, 
I haven't got the bounty chip, so how do we play? And then she looks at me sh and she actually says, is this your first time in Vegas for the World Series? And I was quite embarrassed. I said, yeah, this is my first ever time. He said, it's okay, it happens. He said, this is not a bounty tournament. It's a, it's a shootout tournament. Oh <laughs> so there's no bounty chip that is happening. So that was a little embarrassing because I didn't even know what tournament that I'm playing. And I registered thinking that it was a bounty tournament. That's so fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And in Goa, I'm sure you have so much fun with the boys. Everyone, just like you all are screaming at each other, and it's just Goa. like amazing. It's like a party to be Goa, honest. Goa is actually like like a party because that's that's the time when you know all of us who are playing online are meeting yeah. after oh, three so four good. months, and you know. Some of us are actually not even taking the tournament so seriously till the time we actually get in deep into the exactly. tournament. But uh, till that time, you know, we're just meeting after so long. Somebody's sitting on that table and you're shouting, hey, Dhawal, how are you doing? Hey, Bansi, how are you doing? And stuff like that. So it's a lot. It's just a lot of are fun. Are you missing the Goa action? Uh, live action for sure. We're, we're not only Goa, just just the fact of playing live, you know, with chips and you know, playing, with, playing with the chips, cards being dealt, having people around you. I mean, that's the game that we learn to love. And, you know, we actually missed that. I'm sure it'll start sometime soon, but yeah. You've given us a great example, you know, by this transition mm. from a live poker to a crushing online uh, poker player. So, I mean, it's Didn't really have the choice. There was nothing live happening, so... <laughs> okay, done. So, once this everything is over and everything's normal, what would be your poker dream destination? still remains Vegas because that's I, I don't think there is a better place to play poker in the world. It's the mecca of poker. So if you have to play poker, you have to go to uh, and play poker at the World Series in Vegas. I look forward to the next uh, trip to Vegas. Nice. And Kunal, I mean, we all heard your fun stories, nice stories. I want to know about the hurdles and challenges in your life. Uh, Hurdles and challenges mainly come from the fact that, you know, if you're doing this for a living, you do not have an alternate source of income for you. You know, a, a lot of people who are out there might be having some sort of an alternate uh, source of income. They could be having a good family business or they could have done something before or they have a business going on right now by the side or whatever. But, um, you know, if, when you're playing this as you're living as the only source of income, it does come with its own challenges. And especially for a person who's come from a corporate world, who's used to having a fixed amount of money coming into your bank account every month, which takes care of your rent or your EMI, car EMI or your uh, uh, house EMI or whatever it is, you know, you have a fixed amount of money which is coming. When you make this transition to being a poker player, that thing, that goes for a toss because now you do not know. I might have a particular good month where I might earn X. The next month I might actually not earn anything and actually eat something from my bankroll. So there, there is that uh, thing which is a little different. So I think that's been main one of the main hurdles. And second is obviously the kind of lifestyle that we have. Unfortunately, we live, like I keep telling everyone, we live the lifestyle of a call center executive. We are up and uh, playing when the whole world is sleeping and when the whole world is up we are sleeping so it affects your health it affects your uh, normal life cycle it affects your social life uh, the time that you end up spending with your own family immediate family your uh, parents your brothers and sister your uh, closest friends it, it does affect you need to uh, get around that and you need to learn to uh, work around that so that these are some of the hurdles and challenges that you definitely face and what advice would you give to somebody who's going through the same you will need to find your balance you nobody nobody can actually come and give you the right mantra for that and say that this is the right mantra you will have to do it by trial and error and figure out what is working well for you firstly whether a cash game is what you are supposed to play and whether even in cash game are you more suited to playing live cash games on a regular basis or would you want to play online on on any of the sites or whether you want to be an MTT player and if you want to be an MTT player how many times a week do you want to play how many times you want an off uh, and you have to find that balance and what works for you nobody I can say that this has worked for me you could have a different thing and you know if, if, if a novice player comes and asks us you would give him a different answer I would give him a different answer but he has to do it himself and learn with trial and error and find out what is his sweet spot to know where he stands in yeah. the end. What's your take on tilt issues and how do you <laughs> manage? Uh, 
you know, my screen name on one of the uh, websites on Indian, uh, one of the top Indian websites is Tilt Atma. So that should say a lot about <laughs> the tilt issues that I have. But uh, frankly, really, you look so calm and look at you, so well behaved, yeah, such so, a charming personality. You tilt. <laughs> what do you see, do? Uh, uh, well, tell me, on, what do you do? Like you so just on, your aces just got cracked. On, on the life, <laughs> on the life fells, you would not uh, see that happen too much because I obviously don't tilt that much in life. But when you're playing online, you know you're playing so many to tables. There would be times when you know you've lost a hand, important hand at a very important stage of a tournament. You would tilt, and also there are times when you know. Uh, you have a fish on your table. I, I, I really don't want to say it, but you have a fish on your table who's made you lose this hand because of the way he's played the hand, which has <laughs> happened. These are times, I haven't really done anything drastic, uh, but yeah, I have used some of the choices of abuses because I'm sitting alone in the room. There's nobody to hear me, but I've used the choices of abuses at that moment of time for that person in my mind. Obviously, I never do that. Uh, I refrain doing that on a chat or something like that. I would never do that. But yeah, in my... I've I've spoken it out aloud and I've called him names which I uh, done that but yeah. that's the tilt issues and it has led to I have had tilt issues where I, it has led me to fire more bullets where I should not be doing it and stuff like that which I've done, which has happened with a lot of people it happens to most people but like I said in the last six months that's one aspect of my game which I've tried to control and I touch wood I've actually worked uh, hard on it and I think it's it's been uh, positive change and I'm not really tilting as much as I. Uh, was doing uh, say six months back. What's your piece of advice for those who tilt hard? Uh, the same piece of advice which I got through this article which Webhav uh, suggested to me your job is to play your hand optimally. That's the maximum that you can do. And not get affected by anything that's not in your control. Exactly. What is not under your control you cannot do that. You, you could tilt as much as you want but can you do anything about it? You can't so it's better not to tilt about that. What would Kunal Patni do if he wins $10 million in one tournament? Uh, I would invest a big part of it uh, for my future. I would uh, utilize a large part of it as a part of my bankroll, for sure. I would definitely uh, use a large part of it to buy gifts for my close ones, including my parents, my family. Uh, and uh, I definitely would uh, set aside uh, 5% uh, of it for charity. Wow, that's an yeah. amazing um, yeah. thought. I love it. Um, and generally speaking, um, you know, you've had so many poker tools, poker coaches, mm. poker buddies. Who are the people you would like to, you know, maybe say thank you to for helping you in your journey or, you know, people who have been really nice to you on your journey? Oh, a lot of them. Uh, one of the first names that would always come to my mind when I speak about poker players who've been helpful to me is Amit Jain, for sure. Yeah. He's the he's the person that I was closest to in the initial years of my poker journey in 2015, 16, 17. Uh, for the fact that he was a team pro along with me and I used to play a lot of cash games with him back in Mumbai. And he he's a person who has a very pure heart. He would come and tell you uh, exactly what he felt about how you're playing a particular hand or a particular thing without worrying about uh, how the other person is taking it. He would be blunt. So there are times when I, I played a hand thinking that I've really done well in that hand and I would go and tell Amit, you know, this is what happened, this is how I played. And he would ruthlessly tell me, wow, you're such a whale, you did that. And I would be like, oh, okay. But to be fair, you know, he that's the way he is. He's always been very, he calls a spade a spade, and which is what I love about him. And he's actually given you advice uh, with no ulterior motive at all. He would just give you advice when you ask him and he's always, always been helpful. Uh, other than Amit, at that point of time, all the guys that I spoke about earlier who I have traveled extensively in yeah. the Asian circuit, uh, uh, Shraban, Dhawal, Romit, Akash, uh, Kanishka, I'm sorry if I missed out on a few names, but all these guys who regularly travel, uh, I've traveled with, they have been extremely helpful. They have been there in the poker industry far longer than I was. They have done things and they, would, they have given me such good advice. In the recent times, obviously, like I said, I cannot thank enough uh, Danish and IPP uh, yeah. for uh, m letting me a part of it. And there are three, four people with whom I have been very close in recent times. Uh, uh, there's Raghav, uh, who's been a source of motiva motivation for a long, long time and a good friend. Rajat Sharma, Vaibhav Sharma, uh, uh, Sri Harsha. These are some of the guys I've uh, been really uh, close to. 
And these are great guys. Oh, wow. these are great guys. Uh, I would. Uh, I'm sure they'll all one of you learn something or the other from each one of them. You know. All the time. Yeah. 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 They're, they they're, if it, it might not always be with the to do with how they're playing poker or a particular hand, but there are aspects of the lifestyle which you could pick up, and you know, there's so much to learn just uh, with uh, other people. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, if you had the power to change something permanently about poker mm -hmm. forever. What would you do? To change something? <laughs> I, I really don't know. That's a difficult question. Uh, okay, I can ask you a different one. Yeah. What's the biggest... Just have, have more women playing poker. I think it's good for the game. So if, if I had the power to change something permanently, just ensure that somehow more women play it. I, I think it's a sport which is really underrepresented by women. And I don't understand why, because it's not a physical game. It's a game where which is to do with intellect. And women are as intelligent, if not more intelligent than men. Wow. Uh, so there should definitely be more women who should be playing poker. That's something so you that would you would fix that ratio and make it 50-50? For sure. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> I would I would be like, thank you, Kunal. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a fact. I, I think it's always, uh, uh, they, it's always nice to have them around because it's difficult to play against them because... Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to read women. So, uh, so, whenever I'm asked that, you know, what are the advantages or disadvantages of being a female poker player, I always say that, you know, there are only advantages of being a female poker player. Exactly. Because, you know, men don't understand how to play against you. They, either they underestimate you yeah. or they just, like, you know, they have a very generic view about you. So, I have an aggressive player, a passive player and a female sitting there, you know, yeah. or a lady. Yeah. So, they just think that women play a, a certain general way. And I have always said it's a big advantage if you are a lady who's playing poker and who knows the game even a little bit. You are at a far more superior position than a guy who's playing a poker with more skills. I've always said that. You have that advantage for sure. I think, uh, and I'm, that's why I'm surprised that not men, more women have still started playing this game. Exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, like... Uh, kind of good for us right now because the more women start playing, the more difficult it will get for us. See, women, that's <laughs> why we need to start playing and more of us need to come out. And, and to be honest, I always... I am a big advocate for this and I really feel that, you know, we'll, we'll make good poker players. And of course. So, yeah. thank you for those lovely words. That, yeah. that was amazing. Um, your favorite female poker player and why? Uh, favorite female poker player would be Maria Ho. Yeah. I think she plays well and she's super hot. Nice. Yeah, yeah she plays really well. I love yeah. it. And um, I mean, I've seen her make some very big folds and she always, whatever she does, yeah. she ha she has a thought process behind it and she yeah. backs it and she's very confident. Yeah. That, you know, I did this because of this and there's nothing wrong or right in poker and yeah. this is how... You know, um, we see. I, I think the good thing about women poker players is you don't typically see them do something very, very rash, which is because the way women are made, they are not prone to doing things rash the way a man would probably do it. And I think it's a big advantage on the poker thing, a poker table, because if you're not really doing something very rash, then you're always in control of certain things. So, yeah, always helpful. So, Kunal, I wanted to ask you about some of the common mistakes you see people make, either live or online. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that you make uh, is obviously, firstly, uh, overvaluing your skill and thinking that you know a lot about the game when you actually don't. And uh, like I said, I've been guilty of it. The first year, I got things so easy. I thought I knew everything about poker when I didn't even know 5% of the poker. So you need to actually get a reality check and understand whether you really know the game as well as you do to compete with some of the better players and pros uh, or do you need to really work on your game before you could do that. You need to get the check done. Uh, you need to be uh, honest about it. Uh, second is obviously uh, bankroll management. I mean, if you do not... This is a game where you could make, where you could take years to make a particular amount of bank here and bankroll. And if you are not uh, careful about it, you it could take you just a few months to lose it all. So you need to be very, very disciplined when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, with your bankroll management. And I'm saying this, that the, these are the mistakes which I have made myself over time. And that is after having people trying to tell you, do not do this, do not do that. But you still end up making those mistakes. So the thing is just to, try, just you have to be careful. As uh, 
tempting as it sounds to play a tournament which has a big up top, but if it's not in your bankroll to play that kind of buy-in, you should not, you have to wait. You have to be uh, patient about the fact that your time will come. You will reach a stage where today if you cannot play a 55,000 rupee buy-in high roller in India, you don't need to worry about it. You will, if you're good enough and you work on your game, you will reach a stage two years later and by that time you will have a sufficient bankroll to play this tournament or even bigger tournaments. But today if you don't have that, do not play that tournament because it's just burning your money. And uh, like I said, especially if you are overvaluing your skill and thinking you are much better than you actually are, you will get a shock. You, you know, it won't work for your game. So these are a couple of things you need to be really careful about. Once you said that, you know, somebody, if they really want to understand what bankroll management is, they should challenge themselves from zero to hundred and then keep increasing this number. Um, you, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm not really a big fan of that because uh, I'm more a fan of just trying to uh, understanding your bankroll in terms of your buy-ins. So if you, if your bankroll is hundred rupees, uh, then you should not be playing a, a single tournament with uh, where the buy-in is more than one rupee. I feel, uh, you know, having at least 100 times the buy-in of a particular tournament is what they, you typically say you should ideally be having. So, uh, minimum. Uh, uh, or uh, The number could be different. I don't know if it was 100 or 500 or whatever it is. I, I would prefer uh, a person to do the calculation that way than trying to, uh, you know, make a challenge. But if you are doing a challenge and you can be good at it and have the discipline to do it well go ahead and do it i've never done it myself so i have so i would not really know about that frankly amazing and now uh, one of my last serious questions mm -hmm. your advice for upcoming poker players work hard uh, stay focused be disciplined this is a game and this is a lifestyle where you could be you could go the wrong way very quickly without even realizing it because from the outside, it looks so much of glamour that, you know, you're traveling all over the world, you're uh, playing a game for a living. Uh, it looks very, very easy from the outside. But trust me, coming from a guy who's been in one of the toughest corporate jobs, that is of being a private banker, to somebody who's come to uh, playing poker, I can tell you that this life is way more difficult and more stressful than what it was as a banker. Because on a daily basis, you would get your tilt issues etc. So you just need to be careful about that and you need to work hard on your game because this is a game where there are young guys who are coming and really working hard on their game on a daily basis. So if you do not work as hard as them, you will definitely be left behind and there will be somebody who will do much better than you. Yeah, and take your place. So do not uh, uh, take it light. Awesome. Kunal, I'm really excited for this one. I'm going to say a word or two words, okay? okay? And you have to tell me a poker player that comes to your mind. Oh my God, you're going to get me into trouble for this. <laughs> Please, and, and it'll be exciting, okay? okay. So, table captain. Shri Harsha. Sweetheart. Muskan Sethi. Oh, thank you. I had someone else in mind. Uh, big whale. Kunal Patni. Oh, <laughs> Kunal is so... This is very diplomatic, huh? It's a fact. Okay, underdog. Rajat Sharma. Okay, easy target. Frankly, me. And I've been the easy target on the table a lot of times. But yeah. So I would go with myself, yeah. Okay, uh, too nice. This answer was actually for Muskan, but uh, I've already said that. So too nice would be Minisha. Nice, I love yeah. her. Okay, bluff master. Raghav. Raghav Ansar. Oh, God. Yeah. Drama queen. <laughs> Nikita Luther for sure. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Heartbreaker. God of Sooth. He's been breaking everyone's heart by winning everything right now. <laughs> okay. Solid reg. Solid reg would be Brahma Sharma. Nice. Luck box. Uh, luck box, luck box, luck box. All the poker guru uh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they play really, really well. But, uh, Name one, no? Uh, Ashish Aguja. <laughs> okay. End boss. Danish or Adi, one of them. Difficult to choose, but definitely one of them. I agree. Tilt master. Robin Labru. Yeah. Or Akshanasa, one of them. 
Uh, I think I'll go with Labru. <laughs> okay. The Promise Breaker. Kanishka Samant, for sure. Why? Oh, he's never ever kept to any promises. We are we are going to meet here today at this time. This is the time or whatever. He's Promise Breaker like that. He's promised to come on this season. Oh. <laughs> you don't think that will happen? <laughs> Better follow up with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, done. Um, underestimated. Uh, Romit Advani. Fair, fair enough. I yeah. agree. Uh, big shock. There's so many of them, but I would again go with Sri Harsha. Now, the last one. Showstopper. Uh, Kash Malik, because he has that personality when he walks into a room, people do look up to him. He's a good looking, tall chap, I think. Akash. Thank you so much, Kunal, for joining us today and taking our time for us, giving us such amazing advice, stories, and you know, opening your heart out mm. for the Indian poker community. We wish you all the best and thank you once again. Thank you so much, Musku. I really enjoyed. I was looking forward to coming to this show and I'm so happy that you called me for it. And I really enjoyed it. Thanks amazing. a lot. Amazing. Thank you.